Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th of Iowa's statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about how Iowa farm women develop skills, forged friendships, and foster community through Extension Homemakers Clubs. Whether they canned vegetables or studied global politics, farm women worked through their clubs to improve conditions for Iowa's farm families. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation, but please note we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jenny Barker Devine. Jenny is a historian of American agriculture and rural life with interest in archives and advocacy for humanities. She is the author of many scholarly articles, as well as on behalf of the family farm, Iowa farm women's activism in Iowa since 1945, which explores how Iowa farm women acted to better conditions on the countryside. Her current project, American Athena, Cultivating Victorian Womanhood on the Midwestern Frontier, considers how women created and maintained opportunities for education, activism, and community in the 19th century. And now I'm happy to turn over to Jenny to begin the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you to the State Historical Society of Iowa for inviting me to participate in the Iowa uh, History 101 series. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about we learned to do the things that rural women did, Extension Homemakers Clubs in Iowa between 1920 and 1960. And just a little bit about me. Um, I am an Iowa native from Council Bluffs originally, and I did my graduate work at Iowa State University. And the State Historical Society of Iowa has long supported my research. In fact, this project was possible thanks to a grant from the State Historical Society. So if you have a historical topic that you would like to research and publish, definitely keep an eye out for those grants on their website, which are usually due every spring. I'm also glad to see all of you in attendance here supporting this lecture series. And I'm hoping that maybe some of you will have some personal experience with women's clubs. Maybe you're a member yourself or your mother or your grandmother was a member. And I would love to hear all of your stories about that. So let's begin by asking a big historical question that we will try to answer today. And our big historical question is, how did Extension Homemakers Clubs lay the foundation for farm women's leadership in Iowa? Now, if you're interested in learning more about my talk today, it is based partly on my book, which is on behalf of the family farm, the Iowa Farm Women's uh, Activism since 1945, which was published through the University of Iowa Press in 2013. And even though the book title says since 1945, I looked extensively at the Extension Homemakers Clubs prior to that era because they were critical in laying the groundwork for county and statewide women's networks, and they provided models for leadership and communication. Now, this is important for our discussion today because the future of farming is most definitely female. According to the two, 2017 USDA Census of Agriculture, women own more than half of the farmland in Iowa. Now, sometimes we assume that we could account for this by saying that the women inherit the land once owned by their husbands or fathers. 
that they don't actually farm it. Maybe they hire tenants or they have adult children who do that. But there is another curious trend. According to the 2017 USDA census, women identify as co-principal or principal operators on 53% of Iowa's farms. What this means is that they're actively engaged with day-to-day -day decisions, doing actual farm work, or managing business matters. And even as the total number of farms in Iowa is falling and farmers make up only 2% of the American population, the USDA also found that between 1982 and 2007, the number of female farmers doubled. Today, they account for 34% of principal farm operators in Iowa. And we have every reason to believe that these numbers will continue to grow. According to the American Farmland Trust, most farmers today are older than 55. And the fastest growing group of farmers is over the age of 75. This means there's a lot of land in the United States, approximately 230 million acres that will change hands over the next two decades. It is projected that women will inherit or purchase the majority of that land and with it bring new approaches to agriculture. So what do those new approaches to agriculture look like? Well, over the past 20 years, researchers have found that today's farm women tend to prioritize sustainability and community over annual profits. For learning about new trends in agriculture, they value organizations that emphasize cooperation, mentorship, friendship, and learning through storytelling. In other words, women want to share their experiences and learn from others. They do not want to sit silently through an hour long PowerPoint presentation by an extension agent. They also need childcare and meetings at times compatible with their work schedules. And interestingly, they want to learn from other women. Sexism is still a major barrier in agriculture. It can be hard to buy a tractor when the person selling it to you doesn't believe you know how to use it. And it can be hard to get a loan when the lender isn't sure you can perform the physical labor needed to pay them back. In 2001, a survey of Iowa farm women revealed they felt out of place when visiting traditionally male meeting places like feed mills, equipment dealers, sale barns, and farm shows. Now, lest we think it's all in the women's heads, male farm service providers, including bankers, extension personnel, and government agents, even admitted in another survey to treating women differently because they perceive female landowners to be emotional, confused, and naive. So for farm women in 2021, having supportive all-female spaces is really important. Since the late 1990s, many new organizations have emerged to fill this need. But as a historian, what's really interesting about these new groups is that their organizing strategies are actually quite old. You see, it isn't that women have been in short supply in agriculture. Women have always lived and worked on Iowa's farms. It's just that nobody's really been listening until now. So let's turn to the lessons of the past. Remember, our big historical question that we're asking today is, how did Extension Homemakers Clubs lay the foundation for farm women's leadership in Iowa? Well, exactly a century ago, in 1921, a small group of farm women began earnest efforts to establish the Iowa Farm Bureau Women's Committee which was the driving force behind establishing Extension Homemakers Clubs in Iowa. Now, how it all got started is a little complicated. And just so we're all on the same page, let's talk for a minute about how exactly the Extension Service worked. In 1914, Congress passed the Smith-Lever Act to establish a National Cooperative Extension Service. Its mission was to create outreach programs through land-grant universities to educate rural Americans about advances in agricultural practices and technology. Each state was in charge of implementation. So in Iowa, they adopted a system where the faculty and researchers at Iowa State College, which is now Iowa State University in Ames, 
would translate often highly scientific and technical information into accessible lessons. Then county extension agents would hold training schools where they trained township leaders how to administer the lessons for their local clubs. Neely S. Knowles was the head of the Home Economics Division of the Iowa State Cooperative Extension Service at this time. And she developed this method of filtering information through local instructors because it allowed county agents to reach 15 to 20 times the number of households that they could reach otherwise. The faculty and researchers in the School of Home Economics at Iowa State were eager to share their work in a range of fields, including foods and nutrition, clothing, textiles, family psychology, household administration, and applied art. Iowa farm women were eager to learn, and they actively organized to create and fund the mechanisms to make it happen. So this entire model is premised on the idea that ordinary people, people from local communities, could administer the programs themselves. Now, in Iowa, getting extension agents and home economists into all 99 counties was an expensive and difficult proposition. So here's a quick timeline of how this all developed. So in 1914, we have the Smith-Lever Act. And five years later, in 1919, the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation was founded at the behest of the Iowa State Legislature to promote cooperation and education among farm families. County level farm bureaus raised funds to pay for extension activities in their county. And until 1955, when federal policy ended this practice, county farm bureaus provided three quarters of the budget above and beyond federal funds for extension activities. Interestingly, the male leaders of the extension service and the farm bureau were eager to develop women's programs. They actually went so far to require that in every county and township, women serve as vice chairs for the Farm Bureau groups. The idea was that men were more likely to get involved if their wives were also interested. So in 1921, Sarah Richardson, she was a farm woman from Mahaska County, Iowa, and she was the first chairperson of the Iowa Farm Bureau Women's Committee, which was ultimately founded as a permanent entity in 1922. Uh, she went on a speaking tour throughout the state Here we go. to garner support for county and township women's clubs. At the Iowa State Fair, she asserted that women belonged in leadership roles. When she said, quote, the Federation machine, great and glorious though it is, will never be able to function 100% efficiently until women have climbed into the bandwagon. You've got to get the women if you want to hold the men. Now it's worth asking, what kinds of things did Richardson expect women to do? We can see some hints here in the state fair program where Richardson is listed as a speaker. The women's program consisted of scoring babies, which is a better baby contest to celebrate infant health, uh, as well as hat demonstrations, food canning, garments, a style show, a milk fairy pageant, and health. Uh, and these activities align closely with the work that women did on Iowa's farms. And if we look at the early training school topics, we can see that women are not trying to challenge gender roles. Instead, what they're trying to do is elevate the status of the important work that women already did. So here is a general list of the most in-demand topics from farm women during the 1920s. And keep in mind that during this time, the vast, vast majority of farm homes operated without plumbing or electricity. I think in 1930, um, it was still about 15 to 20% of farm homes um, did not have running water or electricity. Uh, many of these farms still relied on horsepower. And as farm women are watching their city sisters enjoy new household appliances, they're welcoming any hints for how to ease their physically demanding and time consuming work. So the extension service offered the first training schools for women in 1921. And that year, more than 2,000 women attended training schools in 18 different counties. 
right? So those 2000 women then would take their lessons that they learned back to their townships and then teach uh, the other women in the clubs there. And that might sound impressive having 2000 women attend in the first year, but the following year in 1922, Neely S. Knowles noticed, quote, an unusual awakening of interest as 41,000 Iowa women attended training schools just on clothing. So 41,000 women went to training schools on clothing. That was by far the most popular topic that year. Um, they also had training schools on nutrition, which attracted 13,000 women. And 5,000 women went to schools on home furnishings and 3,000 attended schools on how to strengthen the Farm Bureau. Now, this is a very unusual awakening of interest because these training schools actually lasted for five months. Uh, the women only had to meet once a month, uh, but that means that the women had to take a full day off of work and uh, childcare. They had to travel across questionable roads using maybe an early Model T if they had an automobile, um, or maybe go on horseback, or maybe they would walk. Uh, this means that... Um, women had to put considerable time and resources into attending these training schools, which were usually held in the county, but not necessarily close to home. So the popularity of these training schools demonstrate that across the state, farm women found these lessons to be worth a considerable commitment. So what were they learning and what made these schools so valuable? Some of the specific lessons on clothing might include homemade dress forms, where they used a paper mache technique to create a dress form of their own bodies. And these were really popular. Women got a big kick out of these. You see a lot of uh, records of uh, people having a lot of fun with this. And if you are interested in trying this on yourself, maybe you like to sew and you want a personalized dress form, I found all kinds of YouTube videos of people showing you how to do that. Uh, so you can uh, still engage with that today. Uh, there are farm work women here though, who are working with limited resources, right? So they also talked about making over worn garments, uh, using flower sacks to make garments, uh, fashion trends and how to meet the new fashion trends of the twenties uh, inexpensively using sewing machines and laundering techniques and new technologies. So training schools, like I said, they would typically last for about five months. Uh, the township leaders would attend one lesson per month. And then in between their lessons, they took what they learned back to their township women's club, which also met once a month, usually for a full day of lessons followed by some social time. And the township leaders could then go back to their training school to report to the extension agent what worked, what didn't, and what the women of their clubs wanted to know. So they could be easily adapted uh, throughout that five month period. For many of the women who participated, uh, most of them never went to high school or college. And this was an amazing educational opportunity. The women pictured here are standing around a fireless cooker that they had just learned how to make. It was like an early solar powered crock pot designed to save women time uh, cooking meals. So you could set this out in the sun uh, and cook your meal while you attended to other things in the afternoon. Uh, something interesting about this picture is that most of the women seem to be on the younger side. There's a couple of older women there, uh, but that's going to come into play later in this talk, but just noting their younger age. And you can also see a child there with them. It was very common for women to be able to bring children with them to their homemakers club meetings. They might ask older children to babysit, or uh, if they had a teenage daughter, a lot of times they invited that teenager to join them in learning the lessons. So um, as historians, we can look at a picture like this and start to see some layers in our sources. And one question I have often asked is, what did these women of Freedom Township in Palo Alto County think about their fireless cookers? Were they excited about them? Did they use them? And most importantly, did they see their club activities as something more than simple household lessons? 
Certainly, Sarah Richardson thought the lessons on home economics had much broader implications. Here is a summary of a speech Richardson gave in Waterloo, Iowa in 1921. And again, as a historian, I really like this summary because it not only tells us what Richardson said, this source tells us what the audience thought about her words. So in recruiting women to home extension clubs, she asserted that women could, quote, gain a better insight into the community affairs, such as better farm homes and surroundings, better schools and churches, and social conditions in the countryside where they reside. For her, things like fireless cookers led to better nutrition and well-rested women, which translated into healthier and more sustainable communities. Later in this article, the newspaper reporter indicates that Richardson's words resonated with the audience. Her speech lasted over an hour because she was frequently interrupted by applause from women in the audience. But we also have to ask, did the women in the township clubs take to heart that their home economics lessons might just change the world? Well, let's return to our women in Freedom Township in Palo Alto County. Now, uh, Palo Alto County is in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, it's relatively isolated, it's very rural, and it's distant from large cities. But this did not preclude the women there from thinking big, thinking outside of Palo Alto County. In 1925, which is the same year that they made these fireless cookers, they became concerned about the lack of health services in their county. After receiving information about the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Protection Act, they applied for and received a federal grant to sponsor two clinics for mothers and children at members' homes with nurses and a doctor all the way from the University of Iowa. Now, this was not at all unique. Ultimately, many women found participation to be a transformative experience as their input shaped curriculum and gave voice to the values they placed on their work. Township clubs provided a vehicle for putting ideas into action. Throughout the state, club women worked for better roads, health, sanitation services, rural libraries, and school lunches. Having just been granted the vote, women demanded training schools on cultivating good citizenship. In 1926, extension personnel responded to this demand by developing a citizenship program that not only helped women learn governmental structures, but had them delve into the details, such as the levying of taxes at the township, county, state, and federal levels. The course also discussed how extension homemakers and Farm Bureau members should become involved at each level of government. And they strongly encouraged women to take, quote, seriously the privileges of citizenship recently granted to them. Now, women also enjoyed opportunities to engage in activities not related to housekeeping. They attended training schools on leadership, where they learned strategies for organizing, lobbying, and speaking on behalf of agriculture side by side with men. Pictured here is a leadership school from Plymouth County in 1925. And if you look closely, you can see two young women, or excuse me, two women holding young children on their laps. Now their goal here was not to challenge existing political systems, uh, but rather to understand and use them to secure funding for rural education and health and to advocate for farm, farm policies that ensured stable commodity prices. Leaders strongly encouraged women to exercise their voting rights, especially for the good of the farm. In an address at the 1926 Iowa Farm Bureau Convention, Addie Wood of Moville, Iowa, asserted that women should vote responsibly and have a, quote, unified purpose and active program. By organizing around community issues such as health, education, and agriculture, Wood believed that farm women could, quote, do her share toward placing the American farm home in a proper position to aid in the demand for agriculture, agricultural equity. So at this point, I do think it's worth stepping back a little bit and asking, once these systems were in place, what was the long-term effect of these clubs? In other words, how did Extension Homemakers Clubs lay the foundations for farm women's leadership in Iowa? 
Well, during the hard times of the Great Depression and the Second World War, Iowa Farm Bureau memberships fell dramatically, but extension women's clubs remained strong. Owing to their abilities to make do or do without, women's activities with poultry, produce, and homespun goods kept family farms and the Farm Bureau solvent. Club women found that they could leverage their commitment to clubs into increased funding from the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation and greater recognition from the Extension Service. In fact, by the late 1930s, the Iowa Farm Bureau Women's Committee enjoyed the largest budget of any committee within the organization. And they used these new resources to centralize their leadership and streamline programming. Each year, they began publishing an easy to follow booklet with 12 monthly lesson plans from the Extension Service. And their idea was to get all club women in the state studying the same issues. In the post-war period, however, these township women who had founded the clubs in the 1920s had become seasoned leaders and they wanted a direct say over local activities. In 1945, Nell Forsyth of Muscatine County, Iowa, penned the 25 year history of the Cedar Valley Community Club. Forsyth was a founding member and she lauded the efforts of the State Farm Bureau leaders and the county home economists. But she noted that after more than two decades, seasoned club members had tired of, quote, unexpired, uninspired extension projects that produced cheese that soon molded, hats that were never worn, and concocted meals that the hired help would never eat. By 1945, club members saw themselves as community leaders who could, quote, help solve some of the most perplexing questions, both, both local and national. The women of Cedar Valley, quote, needed no outside speaker to construct an interesting meeting and no longer required direct guidance from state leaders. Forsyth concluded that, quote, growing up is as natural a process for a club as well as an individual. And it would be no surprise that the Cedar Valley Community Club actually severed ties with the Extension Service and the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation the following year in 1946. Uh, they remained an active club well into the late 1980s, um, but they decided that they were better off on their own. Now, to further illustrate this point, uh, here's a club that did remain affiliated uh, with the Farm Bureau and the Extension Service. Uh, we are back with the women of the Freedom Township Women's Club in Palo Alto County. They did an excellent job uh, taking photographs and keeping scrapbooks. And these are now stored at the Iowa Women's Archive. And that is why we see so much of them because they were very, very careful uh, to record their own history. Uh, but I love this photograph uh, from May of 1959 when members of the Freedom Township Women's Club celebrated uh, Mother's Day with a tea party and a hat parade. Uh, and this is the same club pictured a few slides back with their fireless cookers 35 years earlier. Uh, the women of Freedom Township absolutely knew about the programs designed by the State Women's Committee and the Extension Service, but in their meeting minutes, we can see that they deliberately chose not to follow them. Instead, they chose activities that were more meaningful to them, like funny hats. Uh, but an even better example would be uh, in the fall of 1952, uh, Freedom Township was confronted with the reality of rural school consolidation. And it seemed as though Freedom Township was going to lose its school building. Uh, the residents felt uh, a real loss at this, and they believed that this was not just losing a school, but it was losing a central meeting place for the community. So in April of 1953, uh, the women of Freedom Township purchased the building and began budgeting to pay the property taxes and to make physical improvements to the building. Over the summer, they painted the walls, they sewed curtains, and they installed an electric, electric stove. Over the next decade, they maintained the building, they uh, held their monthly meetings there, and they used it for special events like pancake suppers and 4-H recognition days. So by doing this, they filled a need in the community by preserving a local meeting place, and they did so with the help of local resources. 
Uh, now, unfortunately, local leadership ultimately was not enough to sustain these clubs across the state. And larger forces led to the decline of clubs like those in uh, Freedom Township. So technological and social changes meant that by the 1950s, farm women lived in a vastly different world than that of their predecessors of the 1920s. By 1950, 90% of Iowa farms had electricity. This allowed farm families to invest in household equipment so that by 1960, 87% of Iowa farm homes had piped water, 96% had a washing machine, 64% had a freezer. And while that might not sound super significant, having a freezer meant you no longer had to can garden produce. Now you could throw it in the freezer, which was a much easier process. Moreover, you didn't even have to really do that unless you wanted to because declining prices for food and consumer goods made it even more cost effective for women to purchase rather than make what they needed for their families. Modern conveniences and consumption of consumer goods required women to acquire new homemaking techniques, learn about agribusiness, and possibly get a job to earn cash income. More women took over the business aspects of family farm operations, while others took jobs off the farm. By 1960, nearly 20% of farm women held jobs off the farm. And this is compared to just 13% who held jobs in 1950. As their labor evolved, fewer young women chose to become involved in homemakers clubs, often citing interest in other activities or a lack of time. By 1957, one national survey of extension club women found that only 11% were under the age of 30. And you can consider that picture of 1925 around the fireless cooker, we can see that uh, quite a few of those women were, were younger. Uh, but by 1957, only 11% were under the age of 30. Uh, the vast majority were over the age of 50. So younger women tended to identify more as partners with their husbands on the farm. And in response, extension programming shifted towards offering couples uh, just starting out in farming lessons on uh, how to run their business effectively. Now, this does not mean that women lost interest in organizations. Uh, they more often sought out groups that more closely aligned with their interests. If they were interested in politics, they might join the American Agrowomen. If they were interested in say pork production, uh, they might join the Iowa Porkettes. Now their mascot, Lady Loinette, might look a little silly, uh, but these women were serious. Uh, many of them uh, claimed feminist identities. And in 1976, they were so tired of feeling dismissed by the men of the Iowa pork producers that uh, they broke away and incorporated as a linked but separate marketing and advertising organization dedicated to promoting pork. By the early 1980s, they managed all of the advertising and consumer campaigns with an annual budget of more than $100,000. Uh, if you've ever heard the um, tagline for the pork producers, pork, the other white meat, uh, it was actually the Iowa Porkettes who gave the gentleman who came up with that tagline his start. Um, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> so uh, the story of the Porkettes, uh, what they show is that by the 1970s, women's voices became more important than ever. Times were changing and quickly. According to the agricultural census, between 1950 and 1970, the average farm size in Iowa increased from 160 acres to nearly 250 acres, while the number of farms declined from 107,000 to just 72,000 farms in the state. In 1950, 30% of Iowans lived on farms, but by 1970, it had fallen to 18%. The cost of production also skyrocketed as farmers began relying on technology run by fossil fuels, and also they needed to buy their feed and seed rather than growing it themselves. The USDA told farmers to streamline their operations, buy more land, and quote, get big or get out. And by the 1970s, we see some interesting things happen with women's, or, or women's activism. You see, during the 1920s, some of the women's most pressing problems were actually close to home. 
But in the 1970s, some of their most pressing problems were in Washington, DC. If women truly wanted to improve their standards of living and conditions in the countryside, they had to step into public places. They had to interact with government agencies, bankers, businesses, and political bodies. Interestingly though, they didn't necessarily change their tactics. They simply modified what had already been working for the past 50 years. They still organized in all female groups, finding more power there than in mixed settings. And they still justified their entry into public places by claiming to be part of a family farm and often claiming that their activism was merely a supportive measure to help their husbands. These groups were very different in the sense that they demanded a seat at the table to engage in conversations about agricultural policy, the environment, tax law, marketing, and agribusiness. Yet what is really striking to me about these groups was that they utilized time-honored traditions of all-female spaces, collaborative leadership, sustainability, mentorship, friendship, and learning through storytelling. And this is where we can see the foundations of the Extension Homemakers Clubs providing a model that was handed down through generations of farm women. So that concludes uh, my planned portion of the talk today. And I'd like to, again, to thank you so much for joining me. Um, I would be very happy to engage in conversation with you um, and answer any questions that you have or hear your stories, uh, maybe about um, Extension Homemakers Clubs. And again, this is that Freedom Township Women's Club. Uh, they're bringing their scrapbook up to date. And these are some of the very pictures that we were able to see today. So I just love the fact that we actually have a picture of them uh, making the materials that are now in the archives in Iowa City. All right, so that is where I will conclude and open it up to questions. Well, thank you, Jenny. Uh, we have time to answer questions. Uh, however, before I pose our first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through our Q&A feature. You can also add your reflections or stories of participation in women's extension clubs in the Q&A as well. Now, we are on a schedule, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar, but let's get started. Our first question for you, Jenny. Uh, since doing your initial research 15 to 20 years ago, what new digital resources have you found that changed some of the things we know about women's clubs? So that is an excellent question. I had a little bit of uh, an epiphany going through um, my, my research, kind of looking back at old research notes that I had taken many years ago. And I realized that I was a little bit short on digital images. So I turned to Google and um, one of the richest resources that I found was newspapers.com. And the reason why this was such a, a rich and interesting resource is, you know, when I was doing this research initially around, um, I think I began in 2001 and I would have ended around uh, 2007. Um, if I had really wanted to see what was happening, uh, what was being reported in the newspapers, I would have had to have uh, probably gone down to Des Moines and scoured reels and reels and reels of microfilm. Uh, now, newspapers.com isn't perfect, but they do have a lot of uh, small town newspapers from across Iowa. And some of the things that I was able to see were uh, things like Sarah Richardson's speech and the response to that. So I have seen all of her speeches. Those were very carefully recorded by the Farm Bureau. Um, but I had always wondered, what did people think about that? And uh, one of the things I did not know, I knew that she spoke at the state fair, but I didn't know that she had gone on this massive tour all around the state. And you can see where she's showing up in different towns. You can see what the newspapers are reporting and what they're saying. And I just loved seeing that these women are applauding her. So they're interrupting her <laughs> and applauding her. Uh, and that was really neat to see that she did have a lot of support from the women that she was trying to organize. Now on the same uh, note, back in you know, 2001, when I first saw her speech at the state fair, I was kind of under the impression that, wow, this is a big deal. This woman is speaking at the state fair. Um, and then I finally, through newspapers.com, get to see the program for the state fair. <laughs> at the time, I hadn't really thought to look that up. Uh, and so I get to see that she's actually talking at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, which uh, she 
her lineup was not uh, full of heavy hitters. The, the big speakers like Henry A. Wallace came uh, in the afternoon. So in, in some ways, uh, it was a big deal that she was speaking at the state fair, but she did not have a priority time slot. So there's a lot that we can learn uh, through some of these new digital resources. And it was so much fun for me to go back uh, and be able to see a little bit more about what women were thinking uh, about this organization in 1921. Our next question, uh, did the economic stress of the Great Depression cause greater activity in the clubs or a decrease in enthusiasm for club activity? So yeah, interestingly, what we see is that women are almost more excited uh, to learn, you know, how can they save money? Um, how can they uh, maybe do work that would earn some cash income. So we have a lot of women across Iowa trying to earn cash income through uh, traditional practices like um, selling eggs and poultry, um, making quilts and selling those. Uh, but we even see women getting into some really interesting side businesses like raising Persian, Persian cats or selling canaries. Uh, and so, yeah, women's clubs actually got a little bit of a boost. We see the Farm Bureau really has this massive decline. I think they get down to just like 18,000 paying members or something uh, by the early 30s when the economy is, is bottoming out. Um, but the women remained very involved um, and their club activities remained very important. And that's one of the reasons why the Farm Bureau decided to sink so much money into them because they were the one part of the group that was remaining solvent and sustainable. Great. Our next question, does the Iowa Farm, excuse me, does the Iowa Farm Bureau Women's Committee still exist? If so, what is its role today? That's a great question. I believe it does. Um, I should have looked that up right before I got here. So when I was writing this, I actually went down and sat in on a couple of their annual meetings in Des Moines. Um, to listen in on kind of what they were doing and, and talk with some of the leaders. So that would have been, um, again, about 2001 to 2007. Um, at that time, um, they were uh, mostly focused on learning about agribusiness. Uh, that was really their priority because most of the women were directly involved with um, running the business operations of their farms. Um, so for example, one year I remember going down and they had a uh, entire presentation on value added agriculture. So at this point, um, again, I need to look at and make sure that they still exist. When, when I was there um, back in the early 2000s, the membership was a little bit older. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see you know, how they have adapted in, in recent years. Um, but they were very much oriented um, towards business as opposed to home economics. Actually ties into our next question uh, about topics themselves. So were topics that were closer to learning about agriculture, like raising poultry, hogs, or was it mostly home economics based? I do love a good hat show though, I have to say. <laughs> you know, Interestingly, I think in a lot of ways, women wanted to come to these clubs um, to take a break <laughs> from uh, the, the very physically demanding labor that they were expected to do. Um, and so they really enjoyed kind of opportunities to learn about um, things like, I mean, th there's a reason why like clothing was so popular because that's a little bit more um, you can sort of sit down and do that. You can sew, you can talk while you're doing that. Um, nutrition is popular because of course you get to eat whatever you make when you're done with it. So uh, a lot of times they really liked programs where they would make uh, certain foods, uh, new desserts. I mean, as new uh, foods are coming on the market, things like Jello. Uh, oh my gosh, so many Jello salads. They loved these because they were just fun to eat and they were fun to make. Um, and so they were interested in poultry uh, because that of course is a cornerstone for so many women. Uh, a lot of these women were supporting their families through poultry operations. Um, but I think, you know, they kind of looked at these homemakers clubs as more of like leisure time. 
Uh, we do see there are other organizations that emphasize the farm work a little bit more. Uh, one of those is the Iowa Farmers Union. Uh, and in that organization, uh, women joined as individuals, not as families. Um, in the Farm Bureau, they joined as families and there, each family had one vote. Uh, so women didn't necessarily vote uh, in the Farm Bureau, whereas in the Farmers Union, they did. Um, and so they also had a sort of women's auxiliary, but it was always controversial in the farmers union because they would say, we don't want to do home economics. We would actually like to do farming. Uh, so women who were more interested in um, the more technical side of farming might uh, go to a different organization um, than the homemakers clubs. Perfect. Our next question, uh, did the township women's clubs have corresponding youth clubs? If so, what did they address? Yes, yeah, so um, they, they would be the 4-H clubs. Um, and a lot of these township clubs supported the 4-H clubs. A lot of the women who led um, the township clubs were also heavily involved with 4-H. And so uh, anytime they were working with, say, the, the young women on their 4-H projects, they might incorporate them into their lessons. And so if a, a young woman was building a garment or um, raising a chicken or um, you know, doing something that aligned with what the, the uh, women's clubs were doing, they would, they would tie those together. So they, they spent a lot of time in their homemakers clubs actually talking about 4-H and youth leadership uh, and trying to bring them up to speed. Uh, they also would organize uh, events. So one of the things that the women's clubs would do um, is provide support to the other activities going on. And that's again, very gendered, very traditional work. Um, so if the Farm Bureau was having a meeting of both men and women, the township club would provide the food and the refreshments. Um, if the 4-H was going to have like a an awards day or an awards banquet, they would provide the food and the place and set all of that on. So yeah, they would work very closely with 4-H. Perfect. Uh, our next question is actually from one of our attendees, um, kind of based on what they dealt with. So are you aware of the lingering women's clubs roughly organized along the township lines? One attendee moved into a neighborhood that had meetings as late as the 1980s and 1990s that they suspect was a remnant of a township club. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, these women were, were friends, um, you know, and so a lot of them continued to meet uh, well into their golden years as long as they possibly could. And uh, we absolutely see these remnants um, all over the place. Uh, by, you know, the 1980s and 1990s, you see them Maybe they meet for lunch. Uh, maybe they meet to do a craft project. Maybe they just meet to kind of chat. Um, more and more, they would sort of drop their affiliations with Extension and the Farm Bureau and just meet as friends. So yeah, a lot of these clubs are tied to that. Um, there are some independent clubs that existed um, and others, usually in towns, uh, were more likely to be affiliated with the uh, General Federation of Women's Clubs. And that's a different organization. Um, but yeah, definitely they're, they're still around well into the 1990s. So we know that some topics were popular, but were there any topics or work that were considered off limits for women's clubs? And if so, why? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've never seen in the records any controversy about a topic that they say, we're just not gonna talk about it. Um, usually what you see is this sort of passive resistance. Uh, one of the topics that I've actually gotten into recently that has just been really fascinating um, is the issue of weight control, okay? So in the late 40s, there was um, a scientist at Iowa State University who was studying uh, women's nutrition and she was doing these extensive surveys of Iowa women, mostly farm women, um, and just trying to learn about what they ate and um, sort of their habits and patterns over time. And one of her conclusions was that farm women tended to have poorer nutrition than women in town. And so uh, she began developing these programs uh, for women to have better nutrition. 
but because of sort of the way federal funding worked and the sort of popularity of weight loss programs in the early 50s, it's a very complicated story, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, this scientist at, the, at Iowa State um, created these programs that you know, could have been labeled nutrition, but they were labeled as you know, how to lose weight, basically. Um, and so in 1954, they um, launched these programs across the state for women to lose weight. And basically the feedback they get is like, I'm not going to step on a scale in front of all my friends. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to do this. Like, this is my time to get together with my friends, like not share deeply personal information, uh, like how much I weigh and, and how much I eat and that kind of thing. Uh, and so pretty much within a year, that topic goes away. Uh, and uh, Pearl Swanson is the scientist at Iowa State who is studying this. And she continued her study. In fact, I think even after she retired, the study into women's nutrition continued, um, but it went back to being a nutrition program as opposed to weight control. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, women were organizing in lots of ways, temperance unions, federated women's clubs, suffrage associations, church auxiliaries, and more. Why did women, Iowa women believe they needed collective organization? Oh, that's a great question, uh, because there's so much overlap uh, between all of those. And, um, you know, I looked specifically at the farm women's clubs because um, in some ways, like if you have a church organization, you, you have this sort of natural identity where people are going to come together because they all happen to be Methodist or they all happen to be Lutheran um, and they're working for the good of the, the church. Um, the farm women are a little bit more complicated. Uh, in most cases, they just happen to live in the same neighborhood and be neighbors, but they might be um, quite diverse in their backgrounds. You know, there, some women might not even have grown up on a farm and they have to learn how to do this stuff. Um, some might be, you know, the fifth or sixth generation on their farm. And so they're coming together and they're forming this identity um, as farm women. And it's kind of helping them cope with some really difficult circumstances. Because remember, again, they're doing very physically demanding labor. Uh, their bodies are often very tired. Um, their brains are often very tired. You know, today we would call that limited bandwidth. Uh, they're working in very isolating uh, conditions. Usually, you know, they're surrounded by husbands and kids who are going in a million different directions. So in a way, it's really fulfilling for them to be able to come to these clubs and talk to their neighbors, talk to other women, um, simply about what their lives are like. And maybe in the course of that, learn some new skills uh, and be able to get together in that way. And before I ask our last question, uh, we had actually a little personal anecdote come in. Uh, Linda Robbins wrote in that her family belonged to the Ruritan uh, group for many years, going to the national meetings as well as local and state. So that's fantastic that she could join us today and listen to this webinar. Uh, and our last question, um, during the, the next webinar, we're hosting, hope you all enjoy and uh, join us for that, with Pam Rainey Kernberg, we'll talk about the 1980s farm crisis. How did women's extension clubs change after the period that you talked about today? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, by the 80s, one thing that they're dealing with is um, an aging population and depopulation. Um, so there's just not as many farm people left um, to join these, these clubs. Um, so they tend to be aging groups. Um, they tend to be shifting uh, more into those social groups that I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, one thing uh, that's a major issue in the 80s is that you have these younger farm women um, who are being deeply affected by a farm crisis and they need ways to organize. They need ways to communicate. And, you know, the leaders in the community, this is the format for organization that they have been used to. Um, getting together in groups, talking to your neighbors, find out what's going on, um, use the existing political process to try to get things done. And so this is kind of the sustaining model that even though it's fading away, um, it's still how farm people tend to understand 
organizing and tend to understand how things should be done. Uh, and so during the farm crisis, what we see is that um, when families are facing a dire crisis, quite often it's the women who are able to seek help. Um, they're the ones who understand that talking to your neighbors is helpful, um, that reaching out for um, mental health services or financial aid services um, is the right thing to do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm confident that Pam Riney Kerberg is gonna fill us in on all of that. But uh, you know, one of the important things to remember is that uh, these clubs kind of laid this foundation of that it's appropriate for women to get together and talk about agriculture and talk about their lives and address these issues in very constructive ways. Perfect, uh, thank you, Jenny. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close but I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today as well. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars to take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our, of our fantastic digital programs, such as the Goldie's Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Stories series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, September 23rd, for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you all again for joining us today, and have a great afternoon.